utter a special prayer just for me. And to be honest with you, I, I feel uncomfortable when I'm put at the center of attention. But at the same time, I needed that prayer. And I just want to thank God. Today, we're going to do something a little radical. We're going to take two stories and somehow try to merge them into the same story. So I need you to be patient with me. We're going to do some reading today. Is that okay? It's the word of God. Amen. Amen. Our first passage, we're going to take John chapter 8 and verses 1 through 11. John chapter 8 and verses 1 through 11. And our second passage will be the same passage that we took on the last time that I was here. And that's Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. The first passage, John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And then we're going to turn to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And when you have found both passages, please join me and stand with me. John chapter 8, starting with verse number 1, and we're going to go to verse number 11, and then John chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. The Bible says in John chapter 8, starting with verse number 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in adultery the very act. Our next verse is what we call church discipline. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continue asking him. He lift up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lift up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let us turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse number 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, 
I have somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one ought, ha the, the one ought 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And verse number 50, And he said to the woman, Thou faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. We will speak from the title today, She Didn't Even Ask for That. Let us pray. Precious God, your word is so powerful. And Lord, our hearts today is filled with awe at the beauty of your holiness. And as we stand before our God and King, we are begging for your mercy today. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you will deliver unto us a word from the throne room of grace. And I pray, O oh Father, that you will be that fountain of water in the midst of a dry desert. Bless us, we do pray, in the worthy and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. She didn't even ask for that. There are many things that we never ask for. One of them, we never asked to be born. Not only that, we did not even ask to be born to the parents to whom we were born. Some of us, if we had a say, we would have even changed the family to which we were born to. You know what I mean, because most of us got at least that one family member that we don't want anyone else to know about. That family member that if we were to invite someone to our family reunion, we would be praying the entire time that that particular family member did not show up this particular year. Amen. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was growing up, I had an uncle, Uncle Tip. And he wore his name well because Uncle Tip was always tipsy. As a matter of fact, every time he knew that we were coming to town, Uncle Tip would have a double portion of his liquor. There are many things that we never ask for. Some things that we even engage in, the consequences or even the rewards that come with them, we don't even ask for that. As a matter of fact, some of us think in terms of that I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, and we never ever think about what all may come with that. We may think about the things that we may get out of them, but we never think about the consequences that we may have to suffer as a result of doing that particular thing. As a matter of fact, we think in terms uh, of that when we, when we think about the sins that we are about to commit. We may see it as just a one night stand, or we may see it as just one drink from the bottle, or we may see it as just one time going to the club. 
but then all that may come with it, we may not be asking for per se. Maybe just by doing it, we may be saying, yes, I'm willing to suffer the consequences. But the truth is, we don't always think about the consequences. And even some of the consequences, even if they were, uh, 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 even if they were told to us, we would not even sign up for them. As a matter of fact, when we look at John chapter 8 and we see the woman who was caught in adultery, there is no indication that this woman was forced to do what she did. There is no indication that she was coerced or that she was tricked or that she was asked to do something that she did not want to do. By every instance, by every single piece of evidence, we see a woman that was complicit in her act. We see a woman who went willingly. She found herself in someone else's bedroom, not because she did not want to be there, not because someone put a gun to her head, but because she decided to go there. As a matter of fact, I'm sure if she knew that this was the day that she would be exposed, I promise you, I know for certainty that she would not have found herself there. I don't know about you, but there are times that I even ask myself, is this the day that I'm going to be exposed? Is this the day that the light is going to be turned on me? Is this the day that the people I don't want to know about this thing, is this the day that they're going to find out? So I don't know what the woman was thinking, but she found herself there. And the Bible tells us that she was taken in adultery, meaning that when they snatched her, she was in the very act of committing adultery. And I'm sure they did not give her time to dress herself. They did not give her time to get her story right. They dragged her right to where Jesus was, cast her down at his feet in the midst of all the people that he was teaching. And they said, Master, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And the next thing that they said is what we normally say when we have our board meeting. Moses said that such a one should be stoned. But what say you? Now, yes, we don't throw stones at board meeting, but we throw the stones of our votes when we're trying to condemn someone. Now, you guys know how I feel about church discipline in the context of how we normally practice church discipline, but that is not what this sermon is about. But the fact of the matter is, this woman was caught in the very act. There was no question as to what her guilt was. There was no question that she was indeed guilty. There was no question that she did commit this particular act. There was no getting around it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that they brought this woman to Jesus because they wanted to have something to accuse him of. See, the problem was that Jesus was preaching a message of mercy and grace, and it appeared that it went against commandment keeping. And so, in the Pharisees and Sadducees' mind, commandment keeping was more superior than showing grace and mercy to a sinner. As a matter of fact, they treated it as sacrilege. How dare you speak against the law of Moses? When Moses clearly says that certain things are supposed to happen whenever we sin, but you're saying that they should somehow be let off the hook. And so they brought this woman because adultery in biblical times was considered the worst sin that anyone commit. Not murder, but adultery. Because of the duality of what adultery represented. It wasn't just that you were unfaithful to your spouse. You were somehow unfaithful to God. It wasn't that you stepped outside of the confines of your marriage relationship. But you also stepped outside of the confines of your divine relationship to God. It wasn't that you just went a whoring after another lover. But it was as though you went a whoring after another God. 
And so adultery was taken very seriously. And Moses did prescribe that such a one who committed such an act should be stoned. But that was the law of Moses. And Jesus came as the ultimate lawgiver. That's why he said things like, uh, uh, it has been said to you that you shall not kill. But I have said unto you that if you even look at your brother the wrong way, if you show anger and you're not willing to forgive, I say that that is just like murder. It has been said unto you that you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus says, but I have said unto you that you should not even look at a woman with lust. Because if you do, you have committed adultery in your own mind. And so there's something going here. There is something brewing here. And it is more than what the woman's guilt was. It was more than the act that she found herself in. This woman was the perfect channel by which they could entrap Jesus and discredit his theology. His theology of grace, his theology of mercy, his theology of second chances, his theology of, of, of inclusion, his theology of embracing those who may have faltered and who may have sinned. And so now they come to Jesus and Jesus did something very interesting. After they gave Jesus all the facts, after they gave him all of the evidence, Jesus stoops down and he begins to write in the stand. And the King James adds the words, as though he did not hear them. I want you to know that Jesus had already made up in his mind as to what he was going to do for this woman, irrespective of what the evidence was. No matter what they were saying, Jesus had already made up in his mind what he was going to do. And therefore, God is communicating to us that there is a prelude to grace. In that, there are things that God does before he actually bestows grace upon us. And the first thing that he does is he disquiets or he eradicates out of his mind the naysayers. Come on. Come on now. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things that people who know me best can say about me. And they can expose me in a drop of a dime. I have a really good friend who jokes with me all the time. I'm going to show up to your church one Sabbath. <laughs> Come on. And I'm going to raise my hand to give a testimony. And I'm going to tell your congregation what you are really about. All the things that you used to do. So anybody can expose any one of us at any given time. Don't think that every single sin that you commit is done in secrecy. Somebody knows. Somebody has seen you. Somebody has heard what you said. Somebody was in the room when you committed that act. Somebody knows. And so, and so therefore, somebody can expose you at any given time. But Jesus did not even want to hear it. He stooped down and he began to write in the sand as though he did not hear them. And then the Bible says that he stood up and looked to them and said, those of you who are without sin, you have my permission to cast the first stone. Amen. Now, something is going on here because Jesus is now laying out a case for this woman. He says, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And even in the context of our quote unquote discipline, those of us who are without sin, cast the, ver the first vote. Cast the, verse, the, the first yay if you are without sin. Uh oh. Why are you so quiet? Grace. Grace. And so now Jesus says to them, if you are without sin, cast the first stone. The Bible tells us that from the oldest to the last, that everyone began to walk out because they were convicted in their hearts. In their hearts, they were convicted. And you know, when we read that, we always look at it in terms that Jesus showed grace to this woman, but 
the people who were there to stone her, mm -hmm. God also showed them grace. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus was the one person that had the right to cast a stone. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to cast a stone at the woman, but Jesus could have easily picked up a rock yes. and began to stone them. And the Bible says that they were convicted in their hearts. They knew exactly what type of sinner they were. They knew that they were no better than this woman who was caught in adultery. They knew that they had no right to judge her, to cast that first stone. And so therefore, they themselves, just by being able to walk out of that room without any scratches or without any bruises, Jesus himself was showing mercy and grace unto them. Now, this is interesting because Jesus, after they started walking out, the Bible says that Jesus got back up again and he says to the woman, where are thine accusers? Now, can I be honest with you guys? I thought that that was very interesting because it was obvious that these men who brought this woman uh, to Jesus because she was caught in the very act. She was caught in the very act. Why does Jesus refer to them as accusers? Because technically, the setting in which they were in was just like as though they were in a court of law. Jesus being the judge. They being uh, uh, the prosecutor and they're bringing out evidence against this woman and they were eyewitnesses to what she did because they caught her in the very act. So they were not accusers. They were witnesses. But Jesus calls them accusers. As a matter of fact, the Greek word that is used there is actually means betrayer. They betrayed the woman by accusing her, and that's how we know that most likely they took part in whatever her sin was. Because by bringing her to Jesus and casting her at the feet of Jesus, they were not just pointing out the fact, they actually were committing an act of betrayal. Because they too were complicit to her sin. And Jesus now says, where are thine accusers? Where are the ones who have betrayed you by bringing you to me? Saints, can I say something to you? When we expose our fellow brothers and sisters, we are betraying them. Now, you may think that this is something that the pastor needs to know, but the truth of, and I'll listen to you. But the truth of the matter is, you are betraying that person. You know why? You may not be exactly complicit in the sin that they are particularly committing. But the mere fact that you yourself is a sinner, you have no right to tell on somebody else. They call that a snitch these days. When I was young, we called them tattletellers. Always telling on folks. And I got many whippings, many stripes, because somebody else was telling on me. It's okay to laugh, saints. But now, Jesus says to the woman, have no man condemned thee? And she says, no man, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn thee? And he says to her something very important. He says, go and sin no more. This is where we're going to springboard because it appears as though Jesus just lets this woman off the hook. No consequences. No punishment. Nothing. Go and sin no more. Now, I want to draw your attention to something, and it is this. The woman did not receive forgiveness. When Jesus told her to go and sin no more, he was not forgiving her. 
Because when we read Luke chapter 7 and when we get to verse number 50, that is the moment in which she was forgiven. Jesus said in uh, uh, John chapter 8 and verse number 11, go and sin no more. And in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 50, he says, thy sins are forgiven thee, go in peace. So she was not forgiven in John chapter 8 and verse number 11. Something else happened to her and for her in John chapter 8 and verse number 11, and it was not forgiveness. She received grace. And grace and forgiveness are two separate things. As a matter of fact, in order to receive forgiveness, you must first receive grace. If you don't receive grace, you don't receive forgiveness. If you don't get forgiveness, you don't repent. If you don't repent, then you will not be saved. So everything hinges upon God giving you his grace. Now, let me share something with you. How I know it was grace is because the woman did not ask for forgiveness in John chapter 8. She didn't ask for forgiveness. As a matter of fact, she said only one thing. None, Lord. Come on. In that whole dialogue, the woman said one thing. None, Lord. And Jesus says to this woman, go and sin no more. Now, there's something very interesting about this, and it's very important because most of us in this room don't even know what God does in order to save us. We don't know the process that God goes through in order to remit salvation upon us. We don't know. We just think that most things happen by happenstance. We think if we pray hard enough, we think if we sing hard enough, if we come to church faithfully, if we, if we do this and do that, then somehow God is going to forgive us or give us salvation. But let me share something with you. There is nothing you and I can do that will earn us salvation. As a matter of fact, there's no sacrifice that we can give that is as valuable as what salvation is. And that is because in order for us to receive salvation, it is basically based on the merits and the goodness of God and God only. It has nothing to do with you. And let me show you how I know why. Because God says that even when we attempt to be righteous, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We don't know how to be righteous. There is nothing in us that is capable of showing righteousness. Everything is based on the righteousness of God and God only. And so this woman at this moment when she is at the feet of Jesus, when she is bewildered, when she is embarrassed, when she, is, when she doesn't know what to do because her life is on the line, Jesus says to this woman, go and sin no more. <clears throat> she was offered grace. Now, we know what the definition of grace is. We know that grace is unmerited favor. Now, that is what grace is, and that is what God does for us when he gives us grace. But we don't know what grace does to us. There is something that grace does to us. And it is wrapped up in the word that Jesus used when he said, go. Now, when Jesus said, go and sin no more, Jesus wasn't just telling the woman to leave and just make sure you don't sin. Jesus wasn't saying, get out of here and make sure you don't commit adultery again. Jesus used the word, go and sin no more. So that means that her going was tied to her sinning no more. And therefore, there was something that God did to this woman, not just for this woman. In that, Jesus did something that was astronomical, and he began a fire right in the bosom of her heart. And guess what? She did not even know it. She didn't know what God did to her. 
All she was thinking is, this is what God did for me. And that's why most of us are messed up. Because we always want God to do for us, but we don't want God to do anything to us. God, do something for me and give me a nice house. But we never ask God to do something to us so that we can earn humility. God, do this for me. But we never pray the prayer, God, do this to me. We want the evidence of salvation. But we don't want salvation to act upon us. We want the benefits of being with God. But then we do not want to be transformed in his likeness. The word go actually comes from a Greek word that means to move from one place to another with the possible implication of continuity and distance. This is powerful, saints. And let me tell you why. Because when, the, when God, when Jesus told this woman to go and sin no more, Jesus was actually telling this woman to move from this place of sin to a place where you will not be sinning. And it was separated, the two places were separated by continuity, meaning it was separated by something that happened every single time. It was supposed to be very, uh, uh, it was supposed to happen in the same context at the same time. It was supposed to be uh, consistent. That's the word I want to use. Thank you, Lord. It was supposed to be consistent and it was supposed to be separated by distance. You know how when God says, I will take your sin and I will cast them into the depths of the sea so that you will remember them no more? That is because God wants your sin to be separated by distance. It is supposed to be so far away from you that you yourself don't even remember it. As far as the east is, is from the west. That's how God wants to bless us. God wanted this woman to move from one place to another place, and it was supposed to be separated by distance and consistency. So now when this woman left the presence of Jesus, she was moving away from the spot by which she knew last where she was a sinner to a place now where her sin will become foreign to her. The problem that we have is that we take our sins with us. They're packed right in our suitcase. We transfer them. It's like moving, changing your address, but then you send the post office a forwarding address. So that all the mail that you got at the old house, you still going to get it at the new house. The address changed, the location changed, but you're still getting the same mail. But now Jesus is saying to this woman that there is supposed to be a divide between your sin and your place of righteousness. And he says, go, go to this place. Divide yourself, separate yourself from this sin, and do it no more. The second thing that the word go means is this. It means going to death. Going to death. It literally means as though you're passing from one life to another. It's the same term that we use when someone passes away, when they die. We say that they move from one place to another. They passed. See, we don't like, the word, we don't like to use the word die. We say, oh, they passed away. As though that now they're just in a different place than they were when they were here with you. So now this word actually means to go down into death. Now, this is very important because when you receive grace, grace is just not um, something that God gives you to get you off of the hook. 
Grace in this context is supposed to now create something within you where your sin begins to die. Now, remember, grace is God's unmerited favor, right? So now what you're doing is you are literally dying to your old self and you are falling in love with your new self. Now, let me illustrate it to you best this way. I have a phone. I love this phone. And let me tell you why I love this phone. Because it's a wide screen. And on top of that, everything that I need to do especially the things that I normally do on the computer, I can do it on this phone. I love the fact that when I put it on my side, it looks like I have a holster on my side. I love this phone. I do. I love this phone. As a matter of fact, some time ago, this phone dropped and cracked, and I got it fixed even after I bought a brand new phone. Because the other phone was too small, and it it wasn't really a masculine phone. So I needed to get back to this phone. Okay, but now let me tell you what has happened. Ever since I've had this phone fixed, it has dropped again. And now the, the, the screen is cracked. And on top of that, it is very sluggish and it stalls sometimes and it, it freezes up. There are times that I got to cut the phone off just to get it to do the command that I gave it. And so it kills a lot of my time at times. And so, but I still love this phone. I love this phone. But now I promise you, if one of y'all, out of the kindness of your God-given heart, decide to buy me an iPhone 6, guess what's going to happen now? Guess what's going to happen? My love for this phone is going to be transferred to the phone, to the iPhone 6. Am I telling the truth? Now, even though I love this phone, most likely, I'm going to start feasting on the divine favor that you have shown to me. Amen. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start using that iPhone 6. And then I'm going to start uh, pulling things up on that iPhone 6. And all the things that I used to do on this phone, I'm going to be able to do it on my iPhone 6. Excuse me. Let me back up a little bit. A little bit. My iPhone 6 Plus. So now, now, the same affection that I have for this phone will now, I will now show it to my iPhone 6 Plus. Am I telling the truth? So now, it's the same thing with grace. It's the same thing with grace. The woman now, when she left Jesus' presence, remember now, grace wasn't something that was done for her, but it was something that Jesus did to her. What began to happen was this woman, as she, after she left Jesus' presence, day by day now, she remembered that she was shown divine favor. But now she had a new object of her love and attention. It was no longer her desire to commit adultery. It was no longer that young, that young man that she found herself in bed with. She began to fall in love with Jesus. Something was happening to this woman. And so the same affection that she had for that, for that illicit relationship she began to channel that same affection and love towards the one who has shown her favor and grace. Let me tell you something. You know why we still struggle with the same sin? Because we have not embraced the grace of God. Let me share something with you. You don't have to ask for grace. The woman in John chapter eight never asked for anything she was given grace freely. Doesn't the Bible says that grace is a gift? Now, let me ask you a question. If you earn it, it's not a gift. It's a reward. If you ask for it, it's still not a gift because you told the person what to give you. 
Grace is given to us not because of who we are or what we do. Grace is, de is entirely dependent on who God is and what he wants to do for us out of the kindness of his heart. Yeah. It's not that you deserve it. It's not that you uh, 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 earned it. God gives it to you just because he is good. Yes, Amen. 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 And so now, this woman received grace, and the grace now began to do something to her. Mm -hmm. See, the story does not end in John chapter 8 and verse number 11. We think that the woman just goes off, and we never hear from this woman again. She never had to pay for her sin. She was never punished for it. There was never any consequences. All she had to do was just walk, get up and walk away. But that's not what happened. The grace of God went with her. And the grace of God began to move upon her heart and her mind. To the point now, we see this woman resurface in Luke chapter 7 at the house of Simon. Simon was a leper who himself had been healed by Jesus. And from the other accounts of the other gospels, we see that Simon was having this feast not only in honor of Jesus, but Lazarus was also invited. And that's because the Pharisees was plotting to kill Lazarus and Jesus. Did you know that Judas' father's name was Simon? The same Simon that we see Jesus at, whose house we see Jesus at, that was Judas' father. How did, how did Judas know that the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus? How did Judas know where to find them when he wanted to give them an offer that they could not refuse? Judas went to the Pharisees and, and said, listen, I'll give them to you if you give me 30 pieces of silver. How did Judas know where to find them? You know how I know? Because when the Sanhedrin met, they always met in secrecy. The, the, their, their place of where they were meeting was never disclosed to the public. But Judas knew where they were. You know how he knew? Because Simon, who was a Pharisee, was his daddy. And they were all in on it. Judas was the informant. He was the inside man. So now Jesus is at Simon's house. This woman now, who have just received grace, shows up at, at Simon's house because she heard that that's where Jesus was. And this woman comes in and she goes right back to the place where she last uh, left Jesus and that was at his feet. And the woman began to wash his feet with her tears and then wipe his feet with her hair. The Bible says that she began to kiss his feet. Then she took oil, spikenard oil, valuable oil that it took a year's salary to purchase and she opened it, broke the bottle open and then began to anoint Jesus' feet. And then the Bible says that Simon is looking at this woman and he is saying to himself, if Jesus was a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this was that was touching him. Because this woman is a sinner. You know why we should not judge others? You know why? Because we are judging the people that God has extended his grace to. See, Simon can only go by the things that he saw her do. But he didn't know what was being done on the inside of her that he could not see. And so now he is still referring to this woman as a sinner. As a sinner. I don't know about you. A couple of years ago, I went to alumni weekend. And I vowed I'll never go again. You know why? Because 
When I was at Oakwood, I lived a certain type of life. I was known on campus as a quiet, spiritual guy. But my last year at Oakwood, I got mixed up with somebody that I had no business with. And guess what people remember? The last year. And what made matters worse, I was like a hypocrite because I worked at the radio station every morning. I'm coming on air. We are the light of the Tennessee Valley. I'm reading scriptures and I'm playing spiritual songs and, and I'm encouraging people over the air to live for God. But here it is. I got this private lifestyle away from the radio station. And see, at a place like Oakwood, it doesn't take long for the rumor to spread. Everybody knew. The people that I didn't even know personally, they knew. And after I graduated, I went to alumni weekend. And soon as I got there, the first thing, it wasn't how you doing, how's everything going, how's life treating you, nothing. Did you know that so-and-so is here? Every, every corner I turned, oh, we just saw so-and-so. They would not let me live it down. When I told some of my friends that God was calling me into the ministry, God is calling, God is calling you into the ministry? Oh, God must be coming soon if you're going to be in a pulpit. I'm just being honest with y'all today. I'm being honest with y'all today. I have a very sordid past. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, lift up my past. But what I'm saying is, I know how it is for God to be doing something on the inside of you. But then when you get amongst the crowd, everybody is talking about your past. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nobody can mention the grace. Nobody can mention mercy. Nobody utters the word forgiveness. Nobody talks about a new life. All they know is this is what you did, this is who you were with, and this is where you were. And let me tell you something, that will follow you for the rest of your life. We take too lightly the things that we do outside of God. Because the court of opinion will never ever forgive you for it. And so now this woman is in Simon's house. She had just received the grace of God. And the grace of God was doing something on the inside of her. It had done its work. It separated her from her sin. And she began now to respond to Jesus in such a way that she began to transfer her love for her lustful lifestyle to that of Jesus. But that did not matter. Because now she is back in the same crowd that condemned her the first time in John chapter 8. And the first thing they thought about is, this woman is a sinner. How is it that Jesus, being a prophet, is allowing this woman to touch him? And we're so crazy, saints. Because we act as though our past puts us outside of the bounds that even Jesus can reach us. Somehow, we are in the ark of safety. But everybody else is not worthy of Jesus. Nobody else is, 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 is able to receive the same grace and the same mercy that you received. And all we're doing, Sabbath after Sabbath, is pointing the fingers at one another. Now listen to this. The reason why this woman showed up, the first time she was brought to Jesus. The second time she came to Jesus. She came because the grace of God had done his work. And notice now, in Luke chapter 7, after she pours out her heart to Jesus, Jesus says to her, 
your sins are forgiven you. The first time he said, go and sin no more. His second encounter with this woman, your sins are forgiven. I will say to you today, the reason why you and I are not ready to even ask for forgiveness is because we have not been able to allow God's grace to do its work. We are not ready to ask for forgiveness. You know why? Because when you ask for forgiveness, not only are you asking that person to pardon you, but you are also saying to that person that whatever I did to wrong you, I am not willing to do it anymore. And now I want to share something with you. Here's the good thing about this thing. When she comes to Jesus, just like the first time, she did not ask for forgiveness. But Jesus forgave her. You know why? Because based on her actions, Jesus knew that she wanted forgiveness. I have a beautiful wife. Let me tell you something about my wife. My wife supports me big time in ministry. I'm able to come and whatever meetings, sometimes five, six meetings in a row, five, six Sundays in a row, I'm here. Now, how do I get away with that? It's because my wife supports me. Now, if she stood in the way, it would be, it would be all, it would, not almost, it would be extremely impossible for me to serve this church like I needed to if it wasn't for the support of my wife. Amen. Now, let me share something with you. During the week, I love my life. I'm just going to be honest with y'all. I love my life. I love the fact that I don't have to rush and, and, uh, uh, to go and punch a clock. I love the fact that I don't have to uh, be involved in, in, in the traffic. I can wait till the traffic die down. I love that. I'm being serious. I love the fact that I have time to sit and just study my word, that I have time to just pray. I have time to feel myself and I get to read and, 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 and recharge myself and, and sharpen my saw. I love that. I love the fact that I, I have the time and the space and the freedom to just sit down and write down the strategies that I want to use for ministry for this church. I love that. I love the fact that when my wife and my children leave home, I just got a nice, quiet atmosphere. I love it. I love that. I love it. I'm the first to get up in the morning to get my children ready for school. I'm ready to get those jokers out of there. And they just don't know when they're pulling out the driveway, I'm just waving bye-bye with this big old smile on my face. I love it. But guess what, Elder? Elder Balfour, my wife doesn't look at my life the same way I do. She does not appreciate my life the way I do. You know why? Because when she gets home in the evening, she wants dinner on the table. As a matter of fact, she was just fussing me out about that just the other day. You know, Jay, I support you in your ministry every Sabbath. I'm the one manning the kids. You never have to worry about the children. You never have to chase behind them. All I'm asking you to do, Jay, all I'm asking you to do is make some dinner. So at some point, I got to come off my vacation, and I got to go stand over that stove. And I got to go in the refrigerator in the pantry and figure out what in God's name am I going to make. And guess what? Now, don't listen to my mother. I am not a good cook. I am not a good cook. There's one thing that I do very well, and that's oatmeal. My children know that if they get left home alone with me, they're going to eat oatmeal. That's what they're going to make. They're going to get it for breakfast. They're going to get it for lunch. They're going to get it for dinner. But guess what? After that talk, after she said her piece, guess what happened? Every day, I just went and made dinner. Now, I saw that it had offended her. I saw that it offended her. She was upset about it. She wasn't happy about it. She didn't say it in a joking way, you know. No, she didn't. She was serious. She had a serious look on her face. Jay, I need you to make some dinner. Okay? So I saw that it 
offended her, guess what? I never asked for her forgiveness. I didn't ask for forgiveness. You know what I did? The next day when she came home, dinner was on the stove. And the next day after that, dinner was on the stove again. And the next day and the next day. And guess what? I got fancy last night. Yes, hallelujah. I went and ordered some pizza. Nobody had to cook. And guess what? I can do that now because I get a real salary. But I did not ask for, for her forgiveness. I showed to her that I, 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 I felt her pain for me or about me by doing what she asked me to do. And this woman, she didn't ask for forgiveness, but she came and showed Jesus that she wanted his forgiveness. Let me share something with you. You do not have to ask for forgiveness. Oh, that's radical. And let me tell you why. Because the Bible says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All you need to do is confess. And God will forgive you. Confess. And God will forgive you. So when she first told me that she needed me to cook dinner, I said to her, you're right. That was my confession. I never said, can you please forgive me for not cooking dinner? Because I showed it with my actions by making dinner. Now, the truth of the matter is, my family struggles to eat the dinner when I make it. (laughs) But I made it anyway. Because that's what she desired. Amen. What I'm trying to share with us today, saints, is the woman got something from Jesus and she never asked for it. She never asked for his grace because grace is freely given to us. And she never asked for forgiveness because she allowed the grace of God to do what it was supposed to do on the inside of her. And it led her to the feet of Jesus. And she showed Jesus that she wanted forgiveness. There's a powerful text. It says, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Saints, let me share something with you. It's not that you get forgiveness from God because you initiated the conversation. God shows you his grace first. And guess what? Every one of us in this room, no matter how bad we may think we are, no matter how pugnant our sins are, Every time we sin, the first thing that happens to us is that the grace of God is delivered to us automatically. As soon as you sin, God gives you his grace. As soon as you sin, God gives you his grace. So now we are condemning people who have the favor and the unmerited favor of God upon them. We may not see the evidence, but guess what? The evidence is not for us to see because God says that we look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Something is going on the inside of all of us. Now, the key is Simon was in the same predicament as the woman who was caught in adultery. The only difference is that the woman who was caught in adultery allowed the grace of God to eat away at her sin and dross. Whereas with Simon somehow justified who he was because of his position. And so therefore, grace never penetrated his heart, even though God gave him the same grace. Simon never asked for forgiveness either. But Simon also never showed his act of love towards Jesus like the woman who was caught in adultery. 
She didn't ask for it. You know why? Because she did not have to. Salvation is not what we request. Salvation is what we receive. We don't have to ask for the goodness of God. God gives it to us because he's good all the time. Come on, KJ. I want you to know that for me this week, this has been very powerful. In that, I too find myself stumbling every single day. There are certain sins that if you just were able to pull back the veil, I would run and hide and I would never show my face again. There are certain things certain situations that I fall in. There are certain times that I'm not in my right mind. It's the truth. I'm not thinking clearly. I'm not as focused as I need to be. And the truth of the matter is, every one of us in this room have that same testimony. We're not always on our best every single hour of the day. We have good days, and we also have some bad days. We have mountains and hills that we have to climb to. We're praying that same prayer, Lord, if you don't move my mountain, give me the strength to climb it. But let me share something with you. God is always pursuing you, always pursuing you. And every time you fumble and fall, the grace of God steps right in and shows you mercy. See, grace is what we get that we don't deserve. Mercy is when we don't get what we actually deserve. So grace and mercy works hand in hand. That woman not only received grace, but she also received mercy because Jesus could have taken up a stone and began to stone that woman, but he did not give her what she did, what she deserved. Instead, he gave her what she did not deserve, and that was his grace. Grace is pursuing you right now. Grace is working on you. Grace is pressing you. Grace is trying to uh, uh, get into your heart. Grace, right now. So the appeal today is not whether or not you want grace because it's not mine to give it to you. And you don't even have to ask for it because God has already given it to you. The appeal today is, are you like the woman who was caught in adultery? Are you going to allow grace to do his perfect work on the inside of you. If that is your desire today, I would like for you to stand. Let us pray. There is a fountain filled with blood and it is drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Sinners plunge beneath that flood and they lose all their guilty stains. Father, all of us in this room are climbing Jacob's ladder. Sometimes, Lord, the rungs, we're not able to pull ourselves up on the next rung because somehow something below us is pulling us down. Lord, we have found ourselves even condemning our own selves because we somehow feel that we are not worthy of your mercy and your grace. But Lord, irrespective of who we are and where we have been, no matter what our pedigree, no matter what our station is in life, Father, every time we falter, you give to us your grace. Your grace, Lord, is the mechanism that you use to begin to woo and to pull at our hearts. Your grace is how you succor us unto you. Your grace, Lord, is the initiation to your restoration. Your grace is what finds us, Lord, when we are running and hiding from you. 
your grace. And so, Father, every single one of us have stood to our feet, indicating, Lord, that yes, we have received your grace, but we do not want to stop there. Now, Lord, we want to allow your grace to break up the fallow grounds of our hearts, to do its perfect work within us. You said that you have begun a good work within us. That's your grace. You said that your grace has led us to repentance. You said, oh Lord, that you will not willingly afflict us. That is your grace. And now, Lord, may your grace do to us just what it has done for us. And I pray, oh God, that we will not fight it, that we will not resist it, that we will not harden our hearts today, Lord, but that we will open up our hearts unto you and allow you to come in and sup with us and so that we can be with you. Bless us, oh God. We're always struggling with sin. We're always overcome by the evil one. We're always down and out. We're always discouraged, oh Lord. We're always crying out unto you. But Father, you have never left us, nor will you ever forsake us. We thank you, God. Bless each person under the sound of my voice today. This is our prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.